I'm not saying that again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> to Brad's good morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it felt so awkward to say it the first time. Me too. Is it recording now? Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Well, even better. All right. So, welcome everyone to the meeting. Um, there is a jam-packed agenda. These get, these agendas are getting longer and longer, but the hours are not getting longer and longer. So we'll see how much of this uh, we get to. If not, we'll uh, go to the next week. Um, as always, <clears throat> always get better too much than too little. So um, just as a release a status, we mentioned last week that um, the new version of the CA had gone out. Um, the biggest announcements in terms of the ongoing agenda, which I'll, I'll click over to, is uh, anyone who was on the contributors call uh, this week, I guess I have to log in, don't I? Uh, heard some of the, the status updates for things that we really hadn't gotten good status updates for in a little while, like near BFT. Uh, Jason Yellick uh, shared that uh, he had been dragged into a few of the things because that's, that's common for Jason. He knows everything, so he's always helpful on anything. Um, but that work is continuing along. And uh, I don't know if you know better than I do. Pam, I'm sorry, I know you're taking notes, but um, was there a date put on that? Do you know? No, he was, I, I think he mentioned he was supposed, to, he was hoping to have something, something ready by the end of the quarter. But I don't know that yeah. deliverable or consumable or but whatever he was working on. Yeah. So, I mean, that's good. I mean, this has been on the, I mean, as I mentioned every week, 33, I mean, that's like a, you know, Buffalo nickel. It's pretty old. So um, it'll be good to see, you know, how that's going to look. Uh, I'm excited to see uh, how that, um, how that'll turn out because there's some, some exciting performance-based um, enhancements there in addition to additional security. Uh, so the channel participation uh, API, I think this work is going pretty well. Um, uh, as, as you all know, this basically allows, uh, uh, I don't know if bypassing is the right word, but you don't have to use a system channel anymore. The interesting thing as far as this group's work will be is how we choose to kind of dock this is, you know, are we going to recommend the system, you know, the participation API over the system channel? Is it just going to be two different options? You know, crucially, will the samples, you know, you know, with the test network, which one will the test network do? Will there be a second second network? I think a lot of these decisions have yet to be made. And, you know, um, maybe the, even the discussions haven't started. Um, so let, when I get to the end of this, and we can maybe mention that or we can put that on an agenda for a future time. But I think it's worth thinking about how we choose to dock this as uh, and where it will sit in a recommended process, perhaps in samples. Uh, so the transaction library, as you all know, basically simplifies channel configuration updates uh, and presumably uh, creating Genesis blocks and things like that. The uh, deployment guide, we have these meetings every Thursday or every Thursday when we're all around. Um, we've started kind of focusing on the peer. Uh, Dave Enyart put together a, a quite excellent uh, Google Doc uh, where he talked us through a bunch of the most important config uh, parameters and so that was really exciting to see that and to be studying that and so that work I think is going pretty well um, you know we have a turnaround on these of a couple of months so we'll see how quickly we can get this one kind of in um, so the samples that's an agenda item for later in the meeting if you want to give you know the 15 second version of that Chris I know you're kind of on those meetings and I'm not yeah, so the big news this week, the 15 second version is, is that the write your first application tutorial has been almost completely rewritten. About 90% of it had to be rewritten to reflect the new um, basic asset transfer uh, application interaction with the, the uh, associated chain code. So uh, that's what we'll be seeing. So this, this is like a, makes me nostalgic because that was the second doc I worked on when I, when I got this job. I have the privilege of writing it and other people have contributed to it since then and I have to make another minor uh, commit to it today. But the, the gist of it is, is that I laid it out how I, how I found it most effective to learn it from a user perspective instead of a, you know, a really experienced dev perspective. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what I did was I have it, and I'll show this later when I share the screen, 
is we show the application code for the JavaScript application and then in snippet form. And then right below that, we show the associated chain code function snippet that it actually calls and then what the expected terminal output should be when the application runs. Um, that way, as the user steps through it, they know exactly what they should be looking at and how it interacts with, it, with it, how the application interacts with the chain code. So, yeah, so that's an agenda item. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more uh, a little yeah. bit uh, later. So just to, to finish up these last two pieces here, the snapshot and checkpoint. I haven't heard as much about this. It's, it's a very difficult thing to achieve uh, technically because there's concerns about does everyone have to take their snapshot of it? Uh, or checkpoints at exactly the same block and how do you achieve that? So this is one where I haven't heard as much about it. It's something that everyone wants. It's just about how difficult it is to really achieve it from a technical standpoint. And uh, the programming model work, as far as I know, is going well. Anthony always gives me updates that you know they're optimistic about this. Um, so I don't think anyone on the call really is involved with that intimately. Uh, so that's the basic uh, updates uh, as far as uh, development roadmap. Um, stuff that's not on here, you know, the token work apparently still is going. I mean, that's kind of not, as we said, on this list, but we'll see when some of these bigger ticket items like the BFT and tokens and stuff kind of become available. Um, so the next piece here is the Asia Pacific study circle. I don't know really much about this. I don't know, David, you, this is a one for you. I don't know much about it. Does anyone know? We may be able to skip. I mean, I, I do know a little bit about it that it's happening. It, you know, uh, they're going through the fabric docs there. Uh, I think it's something that Nina's running. I don't know any detail specific updates for this. I mean, I think it might be something that Anthony was wanting in general to carry over from the Eastern Hemisphere call. I don't, I don't know if he, there was a specific update to share. So I think it's probably fine to skip for today. Well, among other things, it seemed like it already happened. Well, they happen weekly. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So maybe we'll table this and, and for the next meeting, I'll try to learn more about this and see what, what the deal is. Um, so the next piece here is a women in blockchain event. I remember you went to one of these a couple of weeks ago or a couple of years ago, Pam. Um, there's no link here. Here, I can dig up the link. It, that also just happened recently. It's on the YouTube channel, um, also run by Anina here. It's, I think it was more just an FYI that the recording is available. I'll, I'll dig that up and put it in the chat. Okay, cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. And then we have our international languages. I don't know if we have anyone who is on uh, the other languages other than you, Renato. Um, but if you guys want to put the updates here on um, the languages, I, I've seen a, a few of these emails kind of going around. Yeah. Uh, this week I, I, I did the, the merge and helped me to meet to, to the merge of my less less changes in the the repository, and I I I call it uh, um, I I try to reach out Brett Logan, but they don't answer me about to make the CI CD of our repositories. I, I don't know what what's happening with with Brad. You know why they are not answer or or request or something. Uh, I, I don't. If you, you, um, if you want to shoot me an email, I can see if I can ask. Brad yeah, for yeah. Because l last week we talked about to to start to working to to publish the the language documentation and the the, the integration pipeline that Brett is working. It's 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 essentially to to do that. So yeah, it's it's, it's important to to check what's happening. Uh, Beyond that, I, I inclusive Claudio uh, send a message in the our chat because yesterday I talked with the Latin American group. They starting to work. In oh, the there's plenty right there on the bottom. And uh, they created uh, the pull request is six seven, and they need a help to approve to have a baseline of a Spanish language in your repository. So if someone else could uh, take a look in this, this pull request, it it's could be amazing to, to then to, to go ahead in the, the process of the translation, the Spanish, the Spanish translation. 
what kind of help do they need, Renato? Just the, the they need to, to to approve because I'm not uh, assigned to approve this re this request. I don't know why R Russian uh, 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 Chinese is 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 assigned to approve, but uh, not not uh, assigned also. So I can help them. So if you can when look this pull request uh, and and approve, they can have the the baseline. Uh, of, release to to working on our repository yep okay i'll take a look the same same the same way if you can uh, authorize the the the, the american latin american people to manage his own branches it's this could be also uh, amazing because they they have about 10 people and they can manage it himself i believe Okay, it sounds like yeah. their own code owner's file with um, maintainers in there. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the, the, the last thing about the, the international languages, the work that I I doing with David, and we have the first version of a Brazilian Portuguese uh, Hyperledge front page translated. So it's a, it's a work in progress, but it's, it's been amazing. I, I don't know if David would like to, to say something about it. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, thank you, Renato, for providing the, the translation for that. And it is exciting that we're now gonna be able to translate uh, the homepage for the Hyperledger site. I, I put that on the agenda, not to jump ahead a little bit, but I think in my mind, that's a great way for us to make sure that people are finding these, you know, the fabric docs as we translate them. You know, the homepage gets obviously a lot of traffic and how do we make uh, you know, as we make these translations available, how do we make sure that people are seeing them? So, uh, you know, I'm, I want to, I want to talk uh, about making language specific landing pages on the homepage and then being able to point to language specific resources such as the translated docs. So, um, yeah, thank you, Renata, for helping us do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to jump ahead. We can talk about it when we get to it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, sure. the question would be what, what other, you know, resources do, does a language group want to point to? Yeah. And, and Brett's defense, this issue, which we're going to talk about later has taken up, I know a good amount of his, his time because we might have to switch versions of Sphinx and Python and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's become kind of a, a black hole of effort. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get with Brett and, make sure if there's simple approvals that need to happen, we can just make those happen so that people are unstuck. Um, so the next piece down here is sample status. Uh, Chris? Yep, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. Mm. Uh, yeah, let me stop my share. <clears throat> okay, you all see my screen there? Yep. Yep. Okay. So uh, first thing is, is that if we talk, somebody needs to mute, I think. Hey, Jim, I think you need to mute, maybe. Sure. Thanks. So if we, uh, if you uh, pull down the latest um, fabric samples um, in the asset transfer basic folder, um, this is the first part that we're working on. These other ones are being worked, but but this is the one that um, replaces Fabcar. And you'll see here that the structure is that if it's prefaced with the word application, it's the application code in that folder. And if it's prefaced with the word chain code, it's the chain code application piece, okay? So you'll notice that we have the Go chain code sample, the Java sample, the JavaScript sample, and the uh, TypeScript sample. And we've added Java uh, into the application side along with JavaScript. Now, you don't need to match the application to the chain code. You can use JavaScript application to call any of these chain codes if you start your test network with them, just to be clear on that. So the latest one that we did and have, or I have been working on has been, uh, the JavaScript application. And what we did was we used this as the basis for updating the Write Your First Application tutorial. And that tutorial, what we've done is 
We've updated the use the fabric test network tutorial already. We've updated the deploying a smart contract to a channel tutorial. Um, again, this uses um, basic uh, and there's been changes. So we'll have to go back and, and refresh those with some new commits. But um, in writing your first application, this used to say about Fabcar. So all references to Fabcar have been removed. This is on master branch, by the way. Uh, so it's merged into master, but it's not backported yet um, into 2.2. Um, so, so what we've done is we've rewritten most of this. There are some of the images that were still relevant that were left in there. And it steps through, the tutorial steps through on how to run the application and the chain code. Um, and the prerequisite section is pretty much the same. Um, we talk in here about the availability of the other um, types of the uh, of chain codes. Um, and then the, the most, I, I think the biggest change here is that um, we're not using cryptogen and this section here explains that when you use the CA flag on starting the test network, we're actually using the certificate authorities. I, I think um, Nick had had that note in there before and we just kind of revamped it. So, you, hey Chris, it, yeah. it used certificate authorities before, but it was hidden under, the CA flag was hidden under the Fabcar script. So yeah. it's still good authorities, but they didn't get to, they didn't get to see what they were doing. Yeah, and I think this specifically calls out too that we're not using cryptogen, so that the user knows that it's actually the CA coming up. Um, and so, so what we're what we're doing here, we leave a note where where we're saying, you know, look, when you when you run this command, this is what's happening behind the scenes. It's using the peer uh, chain code lifecycle to package, install, query, and approve. Uh, for those orgs and then it tells you what your expected um, output should look like you go through the npm install tells the user what they would see after they did that their their package json file and app.js so on and so forth um, gives the option to run in a new terminal the ca logs um, all this has been tested and it works uh, then you actually start the app now instead of interacting when you run app.js here it steps through everything right so it it goes in, it, you know, there's a note here that says what you have to do for prerequisites. Essentially, that's have the test network up and running before you run this thing, right? Which is why it's first in the tutorial. But effectively, it enrolls the admin, registers the user, imports the ID into the wallet, and then it starts running through the corresponding function calls to the chain code. So init ledger, get all assets, uh, create an asset, read, check to see if an asset exists, update, uh, and and read an update and, and then update where we know that an asset doesn't exist so that we purposefully return an error so that you can see what that looks like. So the tutorial was written to match the application and if you look at the whoops if you look at the JavaScript chain code if I open this to the side um, let me just make this big for a second you'll notice that the steps, it, it matches, right? So, so it's done this way on purpose so that the user can consume what's going on. If you're like examining the, the code or if you're examining the tutorial and the snippets in it. So when this calls this um, chain code function, init ledger, this is what's happening if you look at the chain code. If you go down and you do the evaluate get all assets, um, if you go down into the chain code and you see get all assets, this is the function that's being called. Um, so it's, it's a one-to-one, -one, it's set up kind of neat. Um, and, and the tutorial uh, is effectively written to that regard. So when we get down here to where you're looking at, so we, we talk about what happens in the sequence when app.js runs, it enrolls the admin user, it registers and enrolls the app user, and then the application prepares for the connection to the channel in the smart contract, which is this, and you'll notice that these snippets match what's in, in the app, right? So, um, and then if we go down here, we get, we get to where we actually start interacting, you know, where the interaction happens. And so you'll see that the sample application and is called out here and there's a snippet, the corresponding chain code function for init ledger is below it. And then we show what the expected terminal output would look like. And it, it steps through the same for each one in there. So that's, that's kind of the layout. And um, 
we, we talk about typing and sequencing of those and why it's important for those to match, kind of give the user um, a thing there. This is one of the things I have to fix with a commit today is this isn't in a code snippet, something happened in the formatting there. Same with this terminal output, but effectively you get the gist that, that that's, that's what it should look like. One of the things that we did was we put a note in here, I put a note in here that talks about how when the register and enroll um, is, is done, it clarifies to the user that it's not, it's not happening as an interaction between the application and the chain code. That piece happens as an interaction between the application and the certificate authority. So um, that's just, I mean, that's just, uh, here's the note right here. So it's important to note that enrolling the admin, registering the user, our interactions take place between the application and the CA, not between the application and chain code. And in fact, if you go in and look at the chain code, which is here, you'll see that there are no, um, there's, there's nothing in the chain code that actually supports registering and enrolling a user. So it helps make that clear to a first time user that may not be familiar with Fabric, um, that that's effectively what's going on in the background. So that's, that's it for now. The next thing to be worked on is I'm going to be refactoring chain code for developers is going to get turned into a, a tutorial called, it's gonna get refactored into a tutorial called writing your first chain code. It'll be based on the Go chain code, but it'll still have reference to the other ones that are available. And it'll, um, it'll replace the simple asset chain code tutorial with the asset transfer uh, that's in the Go chain code. So that's pretty much it for me. But do you have any questions about that? So it'll be basically developing the chain code that we already have in samples, right? The, the writing your first app chain code. That's correct. Yeah, so if you, if you come into the Go chain code here, um, into the chain code folder, it'll be based on this chain code here. So is there, has there been any thought to renaming writing your first or I guess writing your first application is fine. Is, is this going to be writing your first chain code? Is that Yes, that kind of it's, it's going to be refactored from chain code for developers to writing your first chain code. Okay. Yeah. Does the uh, chain code development mode work on 2.x? Don't know yet. Yeah. Simon Stone, I asked him that question. He said he was, would look into it because it was a dependency for the VS code, but he was um, skeptical. Yeah, I haven't got that far yet. This but is cool. That's pretty much it. Nick left big shoes to fill, so. Um, Nick and Joe both. So you guys have done a lot of work on these. It actually made my job a lot easier to come in here and refactor these. So you, kudos to you. Yeah, I, I need to take it for a spin. I've been busy, but I, I'll try to get it together sometime soon and go through it. We should probably update the README for, um, I don't know if it's already been updated, but the README for Fabric samples, tell them that Fabcar is deprecated and add the tutorial for the basic chain code. Yeah, I think that's on the work list. Um, in the fabric samples work group, but I might, I need, I, that's a good, it's a good plan. We need to go back and revisit that if it's not. Just so everyone knows one of the fabric samples uh, meetings, those are what Tuesdays, right? At like 10 or something. Yeah. Is that when that work group every, meets? Every Tuesday at nine. Okay. So 10 Eastern time. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Nine <laughs> okay. Gotcha. I just, I, 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 yeah, I get confused very easily with this. I'm stuff. sorry. I keep thinking America ends at the eastern border of Texas. I'm sorry. That's where the United States of Texas starts. That's a <laughs> whole different kind of thing. All right. So uh, the next uh, item here is something I remember I mentioned a, you know, a couple months ago. Uh, but now this has kind of become more important with translations uh, about anchors. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, the, there are no, almost no anchors in the fabric docs as it is. Um, you essentially have to derive the anchor from the name of a section 
and it has a standard formatting that it uses to derive those anchors. But in general, uh, we haven't used them and we haven't created special anchors. And, and this is a problem because in a translation, of course, people are translating the anchor or translating the name of a section into their own language. And so the anchors are not consistent from uh, language to language. Um, so I know this is um, a problem. I haven't been involved in the discussions, uh, Renata, between you and Anthony. Uh, so I don't, I don't know where kind of we are, if there's a consensus gathering around how to address this. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 being, being honest, I, 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 a little bit comfortable to do what to do, what I do now, that is take the original anchor and create uh, uh, explicit uh, mark in the code and it's working fine uh, because in the end of the day any solution that i can see today we work uh he working if if you understand why <laughs> i try to say so the solutions you, you don't you don't think it's, it, it, there's no one solution everyone's gonna have to figure out their own thing is what you're saying yeah yeah I, but i'm not uh, the 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 the, the, the the ex specialist here. So, uh, in my uh, a, a simple point of view, a simple way of of see this this problem, it's working and it's, it's working fine. I, I create a, a workflow where I take the the original anchor, create a, 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 a directive in, in the content. It's working. Um, it's, so one 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 just one step more that one one time finish it i didn't need to to rework because uh, i thought in the suggestion of the last meeting that it's put a uh, um an uh, indexed item one two three four that if it, we do that when you update the documentation and create another uh, uh, chapter inside be between two original chapters, you need to index all documentation. Yes. To, to, I mentioned to, that the other day, you know. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's worse than just I create another anchor and be uh, uh, in compliance with the original documentation. Because if you do something kind of, uh, if you not change the, the title of the, the chapter, it's okay. If, if you change the, 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 the title, I have a, a little problem, but it's not big enough, then need to, he, he index all document, all, do, all document to, to, to make sense for, for the future. So uh, yeah. being honest, I, I, I'm a little bit comfortable, but if you have, or anyone else have any kind of, better approach i i'm glad to to to, to adopt to, without a problem yeah it's so, a difficult one because ideally if we had done the right thing from the beginning or i mean there wasn't any real need to do it uh so we, that's why we didn't and everyone could have used the anchors that we established in the you know the english version and that would have been simple for everyone and then translated the names of sections but we didn't do that and it almost feels like it's kind of you know the horses have left the barn so to speak you know there's no, I don't know how much of a point and how much of a help it would be. I mean, there's more languages in the world, uh, obviously, uh, yeah. but uh, I wonder how useful it would be to go back through and do all of that right now, whatever standard was adopted, whether numbers or anything else. Yeah, in some, some, some ways, my work of translation need to be prepared to do some new work because it's part of my work sometimes do a uh, he work as 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 uh, uh, and the, having this anchors in uh, point to the original anchors i believe that in long term is better to backtrack changes for example so um, yeah it's not a pacific point i don't know if mm -hmm. yeah i mean to be fair most of the docs don't get updated that often because the problem um, I mean, in addition, the worst problem with not having direct anchors is, is similar to what you're saying is if you edit the name of any section, then it changes the anchor, you know, in English as well as anywhere else. And, you know, the, 
the ugliest thing you can do to someone is to break a link for no good reason. It's broken links are bad, as we'll discuss later if there's time. But, you know, so having anchors is good. It's a good practice. It wasn't a practice that we followed. And so I don't know if you know, like, it, are other languages essentially doing the same thing you sh as you did, is establishing their own anchors and they're kind of comfortable doing that? Or, or is there? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. But uh, after I, I, yeah, just uh, you, you, you use your work of last week, Chris, because the, the work that Chris did in the last week that check the broken links uh, also works to me because if you have any kind of issue in bro about broken links, I can uh, process like Chris did in the last week and, 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 and fix those broken links. I believe I, 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 it's, it's, it's better create a, a framework to, to support this this problem then to to create another another approach yeah. maybe i agree with you renato and the reason why is because um it there's we have more than just the anchor problem the the anchor problem is derived from changing titles and languages as you pointed out and joe did the other issue is because we have a mix of restructured text and markdown um, the procedure for doing that isn't exactly the same. And uh, Joe talked earlier about how um, the, the anchors are derived when the HTML is built based on the, the title, right, which, which you've alluded to. And um, when you do, when you run your local doc build, if you're using the pip file and the, and the Sphinx uh, to build your own docs, you get this warning that says this doc doesn't have a title. And the reason it doesn't have a title is because of the change. Instead of doing dashes, it's done with an equal sign now. So in order to make it consistent, we would have to go back and change those anyway yeah. to get doc build fixed. And if we're going to go through the trouble of doing that, as long as we're in there, it, it makes complete sense to go standardize on agreed anchors and put those in there, if that makes sense. And to, to illustrate that, I actually have that up on my screen right now. Um, if you'll, I guess if you'll let me share yeah. Joe for just a brief second. Um, what happens is um, you get this, you get this warning here. And it talks about how um, something doesn't have a title, okay? And th this is in the tutorial source. And if and if you went in there and you looked at some of these, um, let's just let's just get to a, a heading here that we can just quickly change. So you'll see how writing your first application, it has the equal sign, which is repeated underneath of it, okay? Yeah. And if you go down here to before you begin there's not an equal, it's just a dash sign, okay? Well, you'll notice that if we were to go up here to the top of all of these errors, um, you, you wouldn't get that if you changed it, okay? And so that's what makes it... Um, that's the RST what, default is that your top header should be equals, and then it doesn't really care how you do the rest of them as long as you do them in the same order. Whatever order you establish is what RST kind of picks up, and yeah. we kind of, it kind of, we've done a unofficial slash official method of the dashes come after the equals. And then you'll see a mix of the carrots versus, you know, the, uh, you know, versus the squiggly lines, or I don't even know what the official words for all these things are, but like, it kind of just figures out what method you're using and then kind of follows along. And then for the rest of the doc, whatever you establish first. Right. So in this doc, you see that the carrots are there. More more often than not, when I when I used to do them, it would be a squiggly line would come third, you know, whatever. Well, I tested this, and what happens is if you get rid of the e, the dashes and replace them with equal sign, it takes the error out of the doc build. Well, if you do that, then it shows up in the left talk as an equivalent top line doc. Right. That's right. So that's I, why the warning is talk tree contains reference right. to a document that does not have a title. Right. Yep. You can only have one equals header in each RST doc. Yeah. So that, so actually to get, let me just stop the share here and give it back to you. So my point was, is that we have more than just the anchor tag problem that's related to this. 
that's what the point is. And we may have yeah. additional work to do where we could we could do both at the same time if we were to make the decision to go in there and do it. So you have the consideration yeah. of markdown with RST, you have the consideration of a standardized anchor tag, and then you have a consideration of fixing the doc build uh, with Spanx if you're doing local doc build. And, yeah. and to, um, what happens is, uh, and Renata, you've probably seen this, when doc build doesn't work and it gives you those errors, where you have those errors, you don't get uh, a word that's linked to a section you can click on. You get some weird character like a, a close bracket that you click on and it takes you to that page. So um, it definitely breaks um, the doc build when you do when you run make HTML, HTMH, HTML. <laughs> Speaking of things breaking. Yeah, this is a sticky one because, you know, obviously no one likes to go back and, and redo old work. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a couple of issues here that are converging. Um, and some of this will, will come down to, <clears throat> again, not to skip ahead, you know, if we have to move to different versions of, it might, we might be moving back in Sphinx and up in Python. Uh, I'll let Pam talk about that more because I think she she actually took notes. We had a meeting with with uh, Brett about that for the wind checker. So, and that th it's only a temporary band aid. We might have to move off eventually, which could create all kinds of formatting problems. So, I'm a little hesitant to do all this kind of stuff. All, although anchors are probably, regardless of your version of Python, are going to still persist, and we're not going to reformat everything in RST to to mark that. We're simply not going to do that. But um, yeah, we'll see. I, I I would certainly love to do it. Um, it's just about when and who and standardizing around the format. Yeah, there's definitely an issue because um, Sphinx one eight five works fine, but Sphinx three two does not. It breaks. So yeah. All right. So um, let's move on to the next uh, uh, issue, unless there was anything more on that, which I, I assume there isn't. But if there is, just stop me. Uh, promoting translations. So the David and Anthony show will just be the David show. Uh, uh, if you want to uh. <laughs> grab it. <laughs> sure. And I, I, I touched on some of this earlier when Renato was sharing his update, but basically now that we're getting close to having more translations done and published, my, my thinking has moved on to the next step about how do we make sure people see it. And so um, I'm glad that we have the flexibility to offer translations on, you know, oh yeah, thanks for showing you it. Showing it. I'm mm -hmm. glad we, the, the Hyperledger Home uh, website uses WordPress and WordPress has translations uh, ability. So we're, we're initially just limiting this to the homepage. We could choose to translate more in the future, <clears throat> but you can see what Renato did. So I think it looks great. You can, mm -hmm. um, you know, come to this. If you're a Portuguese speaker, you can now come to this and get an overview of what Hyperledger is. And my main concern now is for those Portuguese speakers, how do we give them a path forward? Um, if this was the only page, if we did a strict translation of the English page, they wouldn't then have an opportunity to, you know, connect with some of the other Portuguese speakers. So if you scroll down just a little bit, I think the one main difference I want to point out, the difference between, uh, in my mind, what a translated homepage could look like and the English page is this English page doesn't have that res resources in your language section. And that is where when uh, um, we could point to things such as a Portuguese version of the fabric docs when they go, you know, when things go live, you know, we can make, you know, surface them here so they become more discoverable. Because again, we're doing this great translation work, we want people to be able to find it. So, um, you know, there might, we can do other things to promote it, but it felt like the homepage was a good place to do it. And then, you know, any, any language team could point to other things. I think pointing to the language team itself could be a good thing to do so that people can learn about this translation effort and can take part. And, you know, maybe there's meetups or other things that a given language would want to point to. So there is some so flexibility. How the languages would be shown up here in this top right with the flags? For now, my understanding, talking to our web developer, as we add more languages, you, you start running out of horizontal space. There's a vertical drop down that it can convert to. And I think I haven't tested it yet. I'm I, slightly I, uncomfortable too with the idea that languages are represented by flags. I mean, there's yeah, if you especially you get to like Spanish, you know, like or there's not a flag, <laughs> yeah. you know, like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Agreed. My understanding is it converts to a drop down with you would pick language. And I think and Renato, I don't know if you've tested this yet, but I, I I meant to test this today, but maybe you could just tell us if it works this way. I think 
There's also an auto detect feature. If you have in your browser a language mm. preference, it should serve it up to you. I don't yeah, know unfortunately, my, my browser is in English. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you try. Knowing that you need this, this, this support, you try. <laughs> yeah, if you could try, I'll try too. But yeah, if you could try and tell me. But yeah. I use my, my, my daughter <laughs> notebook. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> So basically, we have a process now. Thank you, Renato, for helping us pilot it. We've tried it here. The Chinese one had already existed, but used a different process that was run by our Chinese team. So we kind of had to redo uh, a new process. So we have a process that works. If other language teams are listening to this recording or looking at the agenda and want to provide a, a homepage translation, they certainly can. And again, they we have flexibility. If they want to point to their own resources, we have flexibility. Any given language can arbitrarily point to whatever they want, and that resources in your language. Yeah, yeah, I, and I like the idea to have the anchor to to the local uh, resources, resources yeah. in your language, because it's you talking to my chapter, uh, pushing us to have a. a, a a uh, comfortable land page in your language. You have mm -hmm. organized this structured, structured page with your meetings, your content. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you you put the oxygen in your wiki page that we don't have today because it's a, a, too much uh, uh, um, oriented to organize organization of the chapter beyond that to provide the content to the, the community. So have this anchor point to our week page. Could you push in us to have some more, more uh, uh, community maybe orientation than, than we have today? And I like That's great. To, to and hopefully it's, an, it's a recruiting engine for you too, you know? I mean, people will come to this page and find out about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I really like it. Uh, um, so, I mean, I can share, I'll keep people up to, in the loop on how this is going again i think you know for for this call the main thing to do is you know once these translations are available we definitely want to think through how do we drive people to them so uh, um you know i'll just keep people in the loop as we add more languages and as the translation translated docs become available you know we can look at that goes back to the google docs analytics you know i think we'll want to spend some time with google docs to see how are people finding the translated uh, you know, fabric docs and how can we do to, you know, increase that. So that could be a conversation. Maybe we dive into the analytics at some point later on these calls to see what else we could do to, you know, drive traffic, but hopefully the homepage is one way to do that. This is tremendous. Wow. <clears throat> a lot of work has gone into this. The Chinese team has yeah. done a, a lot yeah. across the whole site. I, you know, I think for now, you know, for other languages, we'll stick to the homepage, but we do have the ability to, you know, yeah, these have to be changed into SVG as we run into this with the, with our IBM. Oh docs yeah, because it's hard coded the, in. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, you can progress and continue. You know. Sure. So, yeah. Iterate for sure. Yeah. So David, if other languages do want to translate their homepage, should they contact you, or what's the process? If, I think I put a link. If you go back, I'll just talk through the process really quick. If you go back to the agenda. Did I put, yeah, that form, can you click on that, fill out this form? I don't know if this is the best way, this is how Renato and I did it. I don't know if this is the best way to do it. I mean, I'm not, I'm open to ideas. This was just the first thing that came into my mind. The WordPress, unfortunately, WordPress itself, we can't give like direct access. You need to be a website admin. So we kind of have to capture the information somehow and then give it to our web developer. I'm open to other ideas if people have preferences for a better way to capture this. It's like Renato has pointed out a bug in the form so maybe this isn't great anyway no, you know this is what it certainly is Certainly a lot of questions you know yeah so maybe there's a better way to do it i mean if people have yeah, a preference it, it, it works for me and it's it's, uh, it's a pretty simple page and, and translated those 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 uh con this content is, is pretty simple and i i, I actually i don't want to 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 support the hyperledger page so it to me, it makes sense because just I, I can help without to, to, to have the, the, the ownership to the page. So, yeah. Okay. Well, if it works for you, and I mean, so this is open. If other uh, um, languages, like, you know, whatever, Russian, Spanish, whatever, want to try it, there's certainly, it, this is live. We can, yeah. Take I believe when I need to make some, some changes in the translation, I, 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 
So we meet again the the, the, the form and you have another version, mm -hmm. compare and then place something like that. So yeah. it's, it's simple and functional. When you fill this out, who processes it? <laughs> it's super, <laughs> it's manual. I will let our web developer know and I'll just send her the strings. Can we not uh, do this on actual hyperledger fabric blockchain? Like pretty easily. Well, <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, Chris, I'm sure there are better ways to do that. Yes, if somebody could tell me that there's a better way to do it, I'm happy to. I just didn't. If there's a person who has to who does this, like there, you're getting the answer. Then, you know, I, I just don't know how many questions somebody needs to answer. What, what really the approval process is because it's somebody saying, "Oh, it's it's Renato and Renato's fine," versus someone is like, "I don't know who that is," and we better ask someone. That, you know, like. Well, you're you're right. What's I mean, the actual a... process. There is a trust issue and there's, I, I think you're right. I mean, so ideally the language would come from somebody from one of the language groups that's part of that language group and it's not some, you know, buddy who's not familiar with the community. Well, and that was the point you brought up one of the first times you were on a meeting and I, now I forget what company was it, Oracle. They have this system where like there's these people who are not running a group, but they're like a known person who yeah. can be a filter through which other people who want access, you know, we know who all those. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the words coming to mind is cell leaders, but that, that's probably not the right terminology, but. Uh, no, but yeah, I, you're, you're, yes, you're right. I mean, so, and, and I think when you're probably thinking maybe when I talked, when I shared the, the Mozilla. Uh, Mozilla, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think a more, you know, we're just getting started. I think a, a fully yeah. mature open source translation effort, you're right, we'll have language owners or language leads, whatever the right terminology we choose to, to, and they would, they would own, like we wouldn't, they would tell us this is an approved homepage translation. Right. You know, they would, they would manage it within their community and hand it off. I think we'll, we'll evolve to that, you know, and we'll yeah. get to that. Like Anina clearly is the language owner, you know, in her community. And so, yeah, if somebody else, you know, I'd check with Anina before. So yeah, I think we'll evolve to like ownership roles and, and processes. Mm -hmm. you know Renato clearly is the lead you know I mean I think we kind of informally have a sense of who you know is the lead for which language but well Renato is the CEO of Hyperledger is he not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if not today then someday soon <laughs> yeah and, and sure clearly he speaks for you know you know he's I know that yeah. Renato is well connected to the community in Brazil so yeah I mean we yeah but it's more informal today than then probably it will get formalized over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. I mean, obviously, it's just uh, thinking long term about what the best processes are. If mm -hmm. people, this is working for people now, then that's great. Considering how relatively new this all is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think yeah. What's the what's the open source thing about minimum viable governance? I think we'll kind of add <laughs> add the governance as we need it. Yeah, I've heard that term before. I always love how long it is. Like, given that it's minimal. <laughs> this is one of those. <laughs> but I, I can understand the concept, you know. Uh, all right. So uh, this is really nice that people are, you know, the translations are extending kind of beyond just the docs themselves and kind of getting on these landing pages because, you know, that's a big part of, you know, somebody who is like, ah, oh, well, I'd, I'd like to be interested in Hyperledger. I've heard of it. And you know, they might not know that they're docs and other languages but if the landing page exactly. is other languages that might let them yeah give them i don't think the yeah, yeah i don't think that uh, i don't think a translated doc can live on its own without the larger you know ecosystem right. also having yeah, people own. don't even get to the doc to find yeah out. exactly yeah. there has to be a path there has to be a pathway to get them there yeah. right well we have a few minutes uh left and we probably have time for either the broken links or the analytics pam do you have a preference um, I don't have a preference. Um, I guess it'd be up to the other people on the call what they're more interested in hearing about. Yeah, Link. that's fair. Broccoli? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Inclusive, okay. inclusive. I need just to to give a a feedback about. Uh, I almost start to, to talking in Spanish because I talk about the meet of the American uh, group, uh, Latin America group. They created amazing thing thing that is uh uh environment containerized. I, no, I'm sorry. I I can't say this word. Make a, a create a, a container environment of the the translation 
process, uh, I, I don't know if it makes sense to you, but they create a Docker image to, to make the translation. It's, it's be amazing. And maybe in the next week, I, I talk a little bit about that because it right. can simplify the process for the new languages because you just, just take this image and, and go ahead. You don't have any, any kind of issue to, to, to make the, the, the process. And you can introduce the, the frameworks, autom uh, automatization, so on inside of this, this container. That's a really good idea. Really good idea. Yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah, so we'll put that on there, or if you want to, you can put it that on That gives the, everybody uh, a universal starting point, right? And, exactly, right. because Nina had a problem about the versions. They, a Latin America group, had the same problem and, and support both then. So uh, Claudio, that is, is the, the guy that is the, they are leading the process in the Latin America group, creating and we share with us and we can uh, introduce in the process of the tra translation and be pretty simple after that. I, I think also by containerizing that, Renato, you can get over the uh, issue of the uh, having having to make sure you have the correct doc build and Sphinx and all of that, right? Exactly. You can, yeah. You can standardize it. Yeah, it's a really good idea. The, the setup is not simple for who is not uh, who he who can have at minimal technical uh, uh, knowledge. So if you can simplify, we can speed up the process of starting new languages. Yeah, let's, let's put that on the agenda for next week for sure. That'd be great. Amazing. I'll learn a little bit more about that, yeah. So it sounded like there was kind of a unanimous consent to discuss the, the broken links with the, about the five minutes. Uh, yeah, we I, I can... Um... I can bring that up real quick. So um, we had a meeting with Brett. I, I guess if I back up a little bit, there was a um, comment in the mailing list about broken links in our documentation, which is one of my biggest pet peeves, the broken links, not the comments in the mailing list. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I hate it when I find broken links. And I do. we really do try to avoid them as much as possible. And so you know, the further history around this, I was actually out on vacation, I guess, when all this happened and, and Chris jumped in and he was able to generate the spreadsheet that showed, um, I think, um, 40 broken links, um, which was much smaller than um, the broken link checker that Brett actually ran. He so, so what happened was um, we had a developer years ago, Ramesh, who instituted a broken link checker for us. And um, basically it fell by the wayside and stopped working and nobody was able to um, get it to work, mainly because we just didn't have the time and resources. So um, thanks to Brett, he stepped in and he was able to get it to work, but it, it um, ended up, introducing was it 1900 broken links? yeah it was well it wasn't broken links the thing it, so what happened was you know our sphinx and our python are far apart in, in being updated so to get the link checker to work he had to update the python version and the formatting something in there is breaking when it's converting the markdown in the rst it seems like the markdown was actually the bigger problem. Converting it over to HTML, the formatting was breaking all over the place. Yeah. 1900 separate and unclear like what's breaking. It's not super obvious what's breaking. It's not like there's a consistent error that, or something we're doing that's causing it to break. It just seems to be breaking often around code blocks, but not always. And it's just sort of a, these, an infinity of errors that are, would be very difficult to fix, even if we had the time, like, cause it's not super predictable uh, or obvious what's broken. Right. So what he ended up doing to get this to work was he downgraded the Sphinx level from 1.7 to 1.4. And he was able to get the broken link checker to work again. So, as Joe alluded to earlier in the call, this is sort of a Band-Aid. It's not a perfect fix, um, but it does get us around the problem, at least temporarily. And um, one thing I did ask him was, will this impact the language translations? And he was going to go off and run a test, I guess, against Malayalam and make sure that the downgraded Sphinx level doesn't break anything. He hasn't gotten back to us on that. 
Um, so I think he's continuing to work on the PR. It's still a work in, pro work in progress PR. Um, but we're hopeful that this will um, at least get us um, a, a way of flagging broken links. Um, as part of that PR, he did fix all the broken links. So once this is merged, um, the 40 broken links that were in Chris's spreadsheet will be fixed. Um, so that's good news. Um, but yeah, the only ones that are left are ones that are example, like non-broken broken links. So, so if you have any any example, you know, HTML of like your name here or whatever, then that, those will still show up as broken links in a broken link checker, but they're not actually broken. Right. So going forward, the process will be that when you um, submit a PR and it does the build, it will flag any broken links that are in the content, which is nice. Um, I, I, yeah. I think that's great. So then we can go fix them or at least open it up and say, okay, what are the broken links? Oh, that's, you know, that's an example. That's a false, false positive. You don't have to worry about that one. It's not going to block you from merging the PR. You can still merge the PR with broken links, um, which, you know, obviously we don't want to merge PRs with broken links, but if there are cases like that, um, you know, you can still merge the PR, but at least it gives us uh, at more headlights into broken links um, as the PRs are being generated. And so hopefully this will help with the language translations and the name groups too for Renato. And if, yeah, you're, able, if you're able to use Sphinx to do a local doc build, you can actually test the URLs before you push. Right, and, and we all should be doing that. But you know, sometimes content's really long. You can miss things. So this is just a secondary check, which is great. It, so you'll see it in the PRs in the doc build. Um, there'll be a little um, line now under the doc build that says broken links failed or something like that. So, so yeah, the, the basically two parallel pieces of work, right? This is the getting the link checker to work in the short term, and then long term <clears throat> upgrading Python and upgrading the versions that we're using in a way that doesn't shatter the formatting everywhere and the sort of the other piece of work that brett's working on is you know why is that happening is there something with the i think it's called recon mark you know that does this sort of translation of markdown to html is that broken is there something weird going on there or you know with a combination of factors because python whatever version of python that we're that we're working is nearing end of life or, or just about to hit it. So we kind of need to move. Like, it's not like we can just sit here um, on these versions forever. So uh, we need to figure out what's going on with that, that formatting. But the good news is we don't have to fix those, the 1900. Um, <laughs> right. That we kind of have a workaround. Um, yes. Yeah, because it's just not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, Brett and I looked at some of those. Like, it's impossible to even figure out what the heck is going on. Like, why did that break? It's not. It's anyway. Uh, one one so, of the issues that came up really quickly is that the a lot of the links that people were trying to access to were from versions earlier than one point four. So, in the read the docs um, HTML on the Fabric website, when are we going to take those links away and just be able to select from one four to master? Right. I mean in the bottom left of the screen. Mm. Because that's causing a lot of chat and questions and people are like, one four should be the minimum that people are working with in any doc. And uh, so the problem is that because they can still select 1.3 uh, on the read the doc site, I, I put it in the JIRA that we needed to do away with this. I haven't heard any feedback back on that, but. It's a good point. At, at minimum, um, there should be, link checkers running against old versions. So like things that don't exist anymore, we can figure out what to do with those. But I mean, it would be a broader community, community statement than us. I would imagine that as long as the Fabric repo has old versions, the docs will also have old versions. So it would yeah. be a point broader is, discussion for maintainers. Yeah, the point is that we need to come up with a deprecation schedule then because it's, I mean, yeah. like you can't stay on the same, these versions of Sphinx forever. We can't have one three in the doc repo forever either, right? So. Yeah. Fair. No, I, I don't disagree with that at all. It's just, I think the the broader maintainers, and maybe that's something for a community call in a couple of weeks or something. Yep. A contributors call is to discuss that. Um, and, you know, 
I would hope that there would be some community support for that, but you never know. But you know, some people might still be on one one. I've I've heard stories, you know. So yeah, one four is the <laughs> yeah. So well, so right. it's interesting that you say that, Joe, because I was looking at the Google Analytics right before this call, and in in one of those widgets, it shows you know the the path people take through the docs and. Surprisingly, there are people using 1.1 version of our documentation. Yeah, well, and they might not know any better, you know, as well. Or, I mean, look, it, so if we get rid of old versions, at minimum, we're going to have to do some redirects. I mean, I think that goes without saying. It's like there will some of the those versions of docs will exist, but they will redirect because you don't want people just hitting it and it's broken. Well, it, it could be Google search, you know, sending them there too. Sure. Yeah, and all the more reason to have redirects. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as as a community, it's worth you know discussing. You know, should we just you know from a code standpoint get rid of these older branches uh, of the doc? You know, or do they serve a purpose to enough people to you know keep them around? I think you make a good point, Chris, about long term support. I think there's an implication about having long term support releases about what value your older releases have and, and your duty to kind of keep them up. Because if we're going back and having to fix broken links, that is an explicit form of support for older docs, right? Um, well, the other, the other issue there too is that if somebody is using those docs, there should at least be some big header warning on the page that says this version of Fabric is not suitable for a production environment. Right, I mean, you, you don't want people going and instituting one version one one in production. I don't, I don't think. agree with that at all. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's that all makes sense. Now we just need to figure out what the strategy is uh, there, as we always didn't have to do. So uh, yep, we're five minutes over, um, and um, I don't know if anyone else has anything um, they want to discuss. Don't all talk at once. All right. Well, if there's uh, nothing else, then uh, we got most of the way through the agenda. I'm pretty surprised. So